You are listening to Submarine vs. U-Boat, World War II's only underwater battle, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio-only episode for War Stories with Mark Felton. Throughout World War II, Germany and Japan conducted a secret underwater trade in raw materials, weapons and technology using cargo-carrying submarines. Codenamed Yanagi in Japanese, this trade continued right up to the German surrender using German U-boats and Italian and Japanese submarines. Corvetten Kapitän Ralf Reimer Wolfram assumed command of the Type 9D2 submarine U-864 on her commissioning in December 1943. The U-boat departed from Bergen in German-occupied Norway on her first and only patrol on the 7th of February 1945. Her departure had been delayed following a British air raid on the U-boat pens at Bergen on the 12th of January when she had suffered damage. U-864's mission was to sail undetected to the Far East, using the snorkel technology perfected by the Germans and deliver another valuable Yanagi cargo to the Japanese. The snorkel was a special long mast that could be raised above the surface of the sea whilst the submarine was running submerged. This enabled the submarine to run on her diesel engines. It allowed her to remain hopefully undetected, and also to increase her speed whilst underwater, instead of relying just on her electric motors. Included in the cargo manifest aboard the U-boat were 1,857 steel flasks filled with mercury, parts and plans of the Messerschmitt Me-262 jet fighter bomber, the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet Interceptor and accompanying these were legal contracts giving Japanese manufacturers permission to construct these aircraft types under license. The cargo included several other sets of plans for new aircraft and new submarines, as well as plans for Siemens designed and manufactured radar technology. In common with all other underwater trade exchanges, the submarine carried passengers to Japan. They included two expert engineers from the German company Messerschmitt, a Japanese torpedo expert and a Japanese fuel expert who were returning to Japan after being trained in Germany. The Japanese were often able to copy German designs or alter and improve existing products, so this part of the trade was of great benefit to the Japanese. They used it in order to produce new wonder weapons for the Imperial forces. A good example being the Nakajima Kika, or Orange Blossom, jet fighter bomber, which was a modified and slightly scaled-down version of the ME-262 jet interceptor. However, equipment manufactured and placed upon U-boats in the latter stages of the war was not necessarily of the finest build quality, often because the Allied bombing campaign had disrupted production and destroyed valuable materials which were difficult to replace or duplicate. Workers who had been press-ganged into working for the Nazi war effort manufactured much of the equipment and parts, and quality control suffered accordingly through anything from sloppy work to outright sabotage. Not surprisingly, U-864's snorkel developed a fault and stopped working, making a journey to the Far East virtual suicide because of the need to surface in order to recharge the batteries and of course the huge amount of Allied aircraft everywhere by this stage. Wisely, Wolfram decided to abort his mission and return to Bergen for repairs before setting out again. The Royal Navy had successfully deployed its own coastal submarines to shadow the German U-boat bases in Norway, and as luck would have it, the 600-ton HMS Ventura, under the command of Lieutenant Jimmy Launders, was watching German naval traffic in and out of Bergen very closely, lying in a submerged position some 35 miles from the Norwegian port. The hydrophone operator detected sounds in the water on the 9th of February 1945, and a periscope search revealed a German submarine's periscopes sticking up out of the water as the German commander navigated his boat back to port. As well as the snorkel having packed up aboard U-864, one of her engines had started to misfire. 
U-864 arrived off the lighthouse at Helezoi on the 9th of February 1945 and waited for an escort to take her into the U-boat base. But HMS Ventura had picked up the sound of her engines via her hydrophones. The British submarine did not use her active sonar in case she betrayed her position. Launders knew that the U-boat was not using its snorkel apparatus, as the noise emanating from the German was different, sounding as though the U-boat was running a compressor on board. Wolfram had also raised his HFWT mast alongside the periscope, enabling him to transmit his position and intention to come in for repairs to the U-boat shore base. Launders was surprised that Wolfram kept his periscope and communication masts up for such a long time, enabling an enemy submarine, warship or aircraft to visually pinpoint the U-boat's position with relative ease. Launders couldn't attack immediately. In fact, he waited for 45 minutes before commencing a submerged attack. He waited in the hope that the U-boat would surface, making her a much easier target. When U-864 did not, Launders ordered action stations. Captain Wolfram now realised that he was being stalked by an Allied submarine, as both submarines had their periscopes raised and could see each other. His escort had not yet arrived, and Wolfram ordered his boat to zigzag in an attempt to throw HMS Ventura off the scent. This went on for three agonising hours, until Launders got his boat into a good firing position, or so he hoped. All four bow torpedo tubes were fired at where Launders believe U-864 to be. Four agonising minutes would pass before the first torpedo reached the target. Aboard U-864, the hydrophone operator reported the torpedoes running in the water. Wolfram ordered the U-boat to dive deeper and turn away. The first three British torpedoes missed, but Wolfram's emergency diving turn actually brought it into the path of the last torpedo. U-864 was struck amidships, imploded and broke into two huge fragments, falling to the seabed 150 metres or 490 feet below. Aboard the British submarine, the grisly death rattle of U-864, the noises of metal breaking apart mixed with the sounds of rushing water as the U-boat's pressure hull erupted and filled rapidly with the sea, brought home to everyone the horror of underwater warfare. All 73 men aboard the German U-boat perished. Launders did not surface to check for survivors. He was lying off an enemy-controlled port and had no wish to attract the attention of German anti-submarine patrol boats. Instead, through his periscope, he scanned the surface of the water for evidence of the demise of U-864. Carpeting the surface of the sea was a large diesel oil slick that was emanating from the U-boat's fuel tanks, which had been ruptured as she broke up. Bobbing gently on the top was a flotsam of wood from inside the U-boat and a single large metal canister. The latter was used either as a deck locker for stowing a dinghy or life jackets, or it contained the Fokker Achgelis autogyro reconnaissance aircraft for use in southern waters. No bodies were observed, and all went to the bottom, entombed inside their shattered steel coffin. Lieutenant Launders, who survived the war, received the bar to his Distinguished Service Order, meaning the second award of the medal, for this extraordinary action, the only time during World War II when one submarine sank another when both were submerged. But the world had not heard the last of U-864. The wreck was located by the Norwegians in 2003. The 1,857 steel bottles that contained mercury bound for Japan had deteriorated to the point where mercury was leaking into the ocean at a rate of 4 kilos, or almost 9 pounds a year, poisoning the surrounding marine ecosystem. Various proposals have been put forward to solve this problem, from raising the wreck to burying it under a layer of gravel or concrete. In October 2018, the Norwegian government decided to bury U-864 in a concrete tomb, but this has not yet been done. You have been listening to Submarine vs. U-Boat, World War II's only underwater battle, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history videos, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. 
You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.